good afternoon it's monday the 11th of may 2020 just after one o'clock welcome to uk column news your host today mike robinson myself brian gerrish and we're delighted to have david scott bringing us northern exposure from north of the border stats mike uh yeah i don't know how many more days we're going to do this because uh well anyway i've, I've reduced it to this there's really no point talking about the number of global cases anymore because uh, in fact the, you know the number of people that have been infected by this is much broader than just the uh the, the statistics but if we look at the deaths 248,641 uh, and just to put that in a little per bit of perspective uh, that's 0.004 percent of the global population that who have died that have died yes yeah. uh, and uh, so global active cases maybe is a slightly uh, more useful statistic 2.4 million at the moment uh, of which 2.367 are mild uh, and so the serious or critical cases have fallen again to 47,074. Um, but obviously the big news uh, of the weekend was Boris's presentation last night. Uh, this is the new message. Uh, by staying alert and following the rules, we can control the virus. So it's stay alert, control the virus, save lives. This is the new message. The question is, what does that mean, staying alert? Does that mean that we have to stay aware? Or does that mean that uh, they have to stay on a particular alert level? Well, let's just have a listen to what uh, to what Boris said about this uh, last night. And to chart our progress and to avoid going back to square one, we're establishing a new COVID alert system run by a new joint biosecurity centre. And that COVID alert level will be determined primarily by R and the number of coronavirus cases and in turn that covid alert level will tell us how tough we have to be in our social distancing measures the lower the level the fewer the measures the higher the level the tougher and stricter we will have to be there will be five alert levels level one means the disease is no longer present in the uk and level five is the most critical the kind of situation we could have had if the NHS had been overwhelmed. Over the period of the lockdown, we've been in level four, and it's thanks to your sacrifice, we're now in a position to begin to move in steps to level three. And as we go, everyone will have a role to play in keeping the R down. Okay, so we're going to keep the R down. So let's just uh, briefly have a look at the uh, at the five levels and what these mean. So here we go. Uh, basically, we've got uh, infection spreading at a dangerous rate. The virus not contained. The virus contained. That's level three. Virus in decline. For some reason, the uh, <laughs> the uh, fonts haven't worked on the on the live uh, presentation. So I do apologise for that. Uh, level one means no transmission of the virus. Uh, so R greater than one at level five, NHS overwhelmed, hospitals overwhelmed is how they're sort of uh, describing this. Uh, and that would result in full lockdown, Nightingale hospitals to reopen. Uh, at level four, R still greater than one in some, but only in some areas of the UK, hospitals not overwhelmed, and we would be back into lockdown. Uh, when R is less than one, which is level three, uh, that would mean that we would have a partial lifting of the lockdown. So they're saying R is we're saying they're saying that we are in level four at the moment, uh, but we're going to head in the general direction of level three over a period of time. So these aren't individual steps. In other words, there are multiple steps between each of these levels. Um, so then uh, level two, uh, shops and offices reopen, social distancing uh, would be in place, and the vulnerable would stay at home. So. Bearing in mind, we're only starting to make the first tentative steps towards level three. It's looking like people that are vulnerable, older people are certainly going to be in lockdown for a very, very long period of time. Will they ever get out? That's the question. Uh, return of sporting events at level one, uh, only likely with a vaccine. So is basically what they're coming to. But my question then is this, uh, Boris, they're talking about R. But what is R? This is the question. What is R? Now, in his uh, speech there, he showed a graphic which said R is the infection rate. But no, the infection rate is R0. So what is R? And my question, David, if I can bring you into the program uh, straight away is, I, I, you know, 
have they redefined what infection rate is to call it R because maybe they think that R0 is too complicated a, 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 a figure for, for the general public? Or are they in fact, have they redefined something here which they're, they're not necessarily telling us about? I, I think they simplified the language because I've been watching the, the this sort of uh, description coming pl places like the independent always uh, you can rely on the independent to give the, the the government totalitarian view of the world and they're talking about R as the, the 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 number of people that a person with the infection gives the infection to and the reason that one is a critical number is if it's less than one then the infection rate is declining. Uh, the total number of infected people is declining um and and so that the the virus outbreak is is said to be to be in decline so it seems to be interchangeable why they changed the description of it i'm not at all clear on thoughts well it, i think because the overall aim is that nothing shall be clear to the public because if nothing is clear the public remains confused and in that state they can be given instructions as to what to do and not to do, of which the main uh, instruction is to remain under house arrest because that's what the UK is under. So I think this is deliberately duplicitous language in order to confuse the population. And if you notice, uh, Boris, I believe he went to a very, pub a very um, expensive public school, but apparently in that delivery, he could only just manage to read the uh, cue on his screen and he was delivering as if we we're all children. The little swingometer, or, or no, there was a little thing moving down the number of numbers and it hesitated. It didn't even move down a whole degree, it hesitated. This is deliberate uh, mind manipulation. And in a minute, we're gonna show you how real this vicious attack by the UK government on the minds of its population is. So, I mean, David, part of the reason that uh, I'm querying this is, of course, uh, <clears throat> Nicola Sturgeon was asked about uh, R uh, in a news conference. We have a little bit of video here and then, uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on it. The rate of transmission of the virus in Scotland, the R number that you have become used to hearing us talk about, is still too high for any significant change to be safe at this stage. Can we, can we, can you tell us that? Well, I think I, several times now, Chris, I've said to you, I can't tell you that number because the experts tell me it's not possible to say with certainty what that is. So the experts have told Nicola Sturgeon that it's not possible to know what that number is. Um, so how are they going to run their their traffic light system if they don't know what R0 is, if we're talking about R0 at all? Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, this is a pretty spectacular position to be in, David. It is remarkable. This is high quality, non-player character thinking from Nicola Sturgeon. We don't know what the number is, but we do know it's too high. And I've been told both of these completely incompatible facts by experts. And I will believe these two incompatible things at the same time. And I will go in front of the nation and with a straight face and not realizing I sound like an idiot, I will tell both of these facts to the press and the press because they're heavily controlled and you don't get to ask follow-up questions in Scotland, the mic goes off after one question, the press will just have to take it. Okay, so where does that leave us, Brian? Well, what, where it leaves us, uh, Mike, is understanding what's really happening in government. And I'm gonna say Nicholas Sturgeon is no different from the rest of the Westminster backbenchers because they do not have a clue what is going on in their own government. Now let's jump back to last Monday when UK Column had an exclusive uh, whistleblower at pretty high level in Westminster had told us that the whole thing about lockdown is that the government did not want to release lockdown because whilst the population are locked up, it, it gave the government the opportunity to repurpose government. So it was an extraordinary, lockdown was seen as an extraordinary opportunity not to reopen 50 to 60% of what each company does. Um, and then it said, so why reopen schools, care homes, coal-fired power stations? Don't reopen any of them. They are garbage. They're yesterday's technology. They're polluting. They're toxic. They're badly organized. You don't reopen them. 
and the individual went on to say that uh, if huge amounts of uh, money was to be brought to bear 240 billion pounds increasing debt by seven times uh, it was pointless reopening all the old stuff um, now was the time to quote reinvent society so this person who was uh, able to um, talk at very high level with very senior members of the civil service and the government said the government uh, did not want to reopen the country because while the country was locked down this whole reinvention repurposing transformation policy of government could go ahead at speed and of course a major part of it was introducing AI right the way across the civil service which is going to result in thousands of job losses and um, that is going to be mirrored out across industry schools hospitals uh, and, and such like so the government does not want to lift the lockdown mm -hmm. and what we're seeing Mike is the delay so let's come back to uh, this one or use this as our headline for giving our exclusive last Monday but we're going to now say that Boris Johnson is coercing the UK public to accept COVID-19 house arrest because that's what it is it isn't locked down we're locked up in our houses and if you're elderly you're going to be locked up in your house for many months months to come now the coercing is not UK column words as you'll see in a minute but just so that we know what co coercion is it's the practice of forcing another party to act in a quote involuntary manner by use of threats or force now let's take our minds back to this diagram which UK column produced uh, showing that Bill Gates was absolutely central to every single piece of policy around COVID lockdown and the uh, desire to get those vaccines in and you've just shown Mike that they are still after getting Bill Gates vaccines to everybody in the country before we're free but this is the bit we need to concentrate on the scientific advisory group for emergency sage and um, what have we got to report well we were given two days ago an internal document from sage and let's have a look at what it is talking about it's dated the 26th of March 2020 the headline is options for increasing adherence to social distancing measures question to be addressed what are the options for increasing that adherence uh, the paper addresses two distancing me measures general social distancing by everyone and shielding vulnerable people for at least at least 12 weeks so there's part of your answer Mike it's clearly known inside SAGE that they're not going to let elderly people out of their homes and this is the note at the end of the document so that people know we're dealing in factual documents here uh, this paper was prepared by SAGE's behavioral science subgroup SBI hyphen B for discussion at SAGE 18 on the 23rd of March now we've taken some damning excerpts out of this document uh, but it's real and my goodness this is so dangerous so here's the government talking about persuasion per uh, perceived threat um, a substantial number of people do not feel sufficiently personally threatened it could be that they're reassured by the low death rate in their demographic group although levels of concern may be rising and what does it go on to say they're in bold the perceived level of personal threat needs to be quote increased amongst those who are complacent using hard-hitting emotional messaging to be effective this must also empower people by making clear the actions they can take to reduce the threat now that last statement Mike is not about the actions they can take it's the actions the government wants them to take and the re the reason it is saying it's going to make people more fearful in order to get this agenda across but but I'm I'm struggling I'm struggling to see how this is not a direct psychological attack on everybody in this country it is Mike it is a direct psychological attack and if you look at the number of charities and organizations saying that we've got uh, an increasing mental health uh, problem in this country people are stressed 
uh, people are some of them in suicidal position this is the british government using applied behavioral psychology inside the covid science group to make people frightened so that it can put its agenda in place when we get to the end of this document you're not going to believe what it says but let's move on so here we've got part of a table which appears at the end of the document it's called a P's that comes from the title of the columns acceptability practicability, effectiveness affordability spillover effects and equity and I'll say to um, David I'll I'll come to to you on equity in just a moment but look at what it is saying down here use the media to increase the sense of personal threat use the media to make people fearful and why do you do that well psychologists have been telling us all weekend you do that because when people are fearful and stressed it is easier to use applied behavioral psychology to get them to do what you want it even admits that this could be harmful but of course it only describes it as a spillover effect this is a bit like talking about collateral damage instead of saying thousands of people innocent people killed in a war this is a very callous document David equity we had a little discussion on because when we look at this excerpt from the sage behavioral document there's no humanity in it there's no compassion there is nothing to do with people being concerned about other people who are sick but what does equity mean do you think well it's a very good question because it could mean one of two things it could mean some sort of impartiality or fairness that's that that's something that you would think the government would call fairness because they love that word it usually comes before they pick your pocket but the other definition the legal one is of course a body of law that falls outside the common law it's just very interesting that that word should crop up in that it, document indeed it is so let's move on we've got uh, government controlled social disapproval now think about this for the government to be using social disapproval the government has got to get into that community in order to stir up that disapproval so it says social disapproval from one's community can play an important role in preventing anti-social behavior or discouraging failure to enact uh, pro-social behavior consideration should also be given to the use of social disapproval but with a strong caveat around unwanted negative uh, consequences so they're recognizing here that if you go in and stir up one part of a community against another part what can you have you can have brutality you can have people attacked in the streets because they've dared to give the wrong response to another member of the public and it goes on government controlled enablement and uh, so what have we got here community resourcing people are being asked to give up valued activities and access to resources for an extended period they need to be compensated and it goes on adequately resourced community infrastructure and mobilization needs to be developed rapidly and with coverage across all communities now here what we're seeing is the government is putting its tentacles right the way into society this will be through local authorities parish councils but also through charities in order to get its message across mm. so we get a note through our door from a local charity thinking it's their opinion no 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 this has come from the government and if we come back to the uh, appease um, template here uh, I can't give you them all because we simply don't have time but this is the social distancing evaluation grid and I'm looking at the options on the left hand side and what do we see we see this use the media to increase the sense of personal threat use the media to increase the sense of responsibility of others use the media to promote positive messaging around actions tailor the messaging and uh, use and promote social approval for desired behaviors this is like something out of communist china this is Boris Johnson's government using the wider media to use his applied behavioral psychology to keep us locked up 
I can't express how dangerous it is, is my, when we got this document, it was unbelievable. We know there are more and we're hopeful we're gonna get some more of those documents. Now, this is the methodology. And what does uh, the, the SPY B team have to say? They have to say this, this report was drafted by two members of the SPY B panel and nine further members commented following which the report was revised. Uh, well, okay. But here's a caveat that also sits close to that comment. Caveat, much of the evidence that's been drawn on is very recent and has, quote, not been subject to peer review. In some cases, the source is a spy B paper that involves expert opinion. This, <coughs> sorry, this report has been put together rapidly and has been subject to limited scrutiny and review. So we have a team cobbled together no checks on their work and what is the result that the population of uk is to be kept in their houses and the whole of uk industry is to be shut down producing the worst economic uh, decline in 300 years mike if this wasn't real you would say i can't believe this but this is their well, own document well it is their own document and we can see the effects of it because of course that document is dated the 22nd of march we're now in the uh, coming up, up to the second week of May, and and uh, we we've seen the effects of this. We've seen the stories that have appeared appeared in the press. We've seen the the, the inflammatory headlines, the clickbaity headlines, the headlines designed to instill fear. Uh, David, to my mind, this goes beyond just being dangerous. This is a criminal act. It's utterly totalitarian because now everything you think has been manipulated by the government. It's ruled by fear, not by reason. Right? It's by fear. Um, and the, 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 the idea we're using, we're setting neighbours against one another in order to control people is deeply sinister. It makes more sense of the BBC report I saw last week, uh, which said to snitch or not to snitch, and was a discussion on the pros and cons of reporting your neighbour for breaking COVID-19 guidelines. <laughs> exactly. And just to ram this home to our audience today, because this is just so, so important, I bring you back to the government's own document, Mindspace. This is from about 2010. It was produced by the Cabinet Office and the Institute for Government. And what was it? It was influencing behaviour through public policy. This was the dangerous section of this document. That means that citizens may not, quote, fully realise that their behaviour is being changed or at least how it is being changed. Clearly, this opens up the government to charges of manipulation. And that is exactly the charge that UK Column is going to put to Boris Johnson's Conservative government today. The government is maliciously manipulating public fear and behavior in order to get through its political agenda. This was the warning we started to put out in 2013, the Express talking about the so-called nudge unit. This is the behavioral insights team that was producing this stuff. We warned about this pernicious charity that was working at very high level um, of, the UK, of the UK government in order to reframe people and look at what they're talking about using idiots running over people undermining them go rounding them go around them discredit them this is vicious vicious stuff this is clearly applied psychology it was being done with a charity but let's get back to sage who are we interested in that organization well it's this gentleman sir david halpin because he is the kingpin from the behavioral insights team linked to the cabinet office and we can go back to work that the uk column did in 2011 uh, where we were warning that around the conservative government um, david cameron of course at the time but also francis maud uh, the two key people, the head of the civil service, uh, Gus O'Donnell, and a, an advisor, Jeff Mulgam, but also the head of that charity, Julia Middleton. And what were they working on? Uh, sorry, I'll just put that in because Gus O'Donnell was later replaced by Sir Bob Kerslake. Uh, what were they working on? 
Well, they were working in the background with the French government in secret meetings with this gentleman, Oliver Willier, in order to discuss how to use this applied psychology on the minds of the British and French uh, population. And if we take you on down, here is the man that we're interested in. This is Sir David Halpin. Doctor. Uh, sorry, Dr. David Halpin, who was the kingpin of this behavioral agenda. And it was first used internally on departments inside government. DEFRA was the key one, a 34 million behavioral change program, very, very dangerous. But on the right, of course, the objective was to get the British public to obey. And where were they headed for? A complete change of society, which was called big society. And of course, Eric Pickles was the big man in charge of communities at that stage. So this was our warning back in 2011 about this French expert in brainwashing. And he's been working at the heart of the British government, except the British public not told. What's the result of this policy? Death. And here was the Mirrors article saying that between 7,500 and 17,500 elderly people have died as a result of this vicious, vicious applied behavioural psychology. Now, is Hancock the full guy because he's the one taking the heat and the people behind the scenes repurposing the government are the key ones? Let's ask the question, the Boris Johnson Conservative government is lying over the COVID-19 statistics. We know why, to create an agenda of fear. Why is that happening? Well, it's to enhance the effectiveness of applied behavioural psychology on the population and to bring in a repurposed society, economy, government and constitution. This is malfeasance in public office. That is a criminal offence. The killing of elderly people, many people would say, is purely murder. David, I'm going to stop because this is so outrageous, it's almost difficult to report. It is, and it's been coming for a long time. It's fascinating that the column was covering this all those years ago, um, and we're now seeing uh, the, uh, the, the, the actual laying out of the process, or the, the, the fruition of the process of changing the way people think. Now, going a little bit further back in time, uh, this in fact started back in the 20s uh, with Edward Bernays, who invented propaganda and public relations. And uh, I thought it was, it'd be good to finish this section on a quote from him. He said in his uh, piece, Propaganda from 1928, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. So there we have it. An invisible government is controlling us all right now. If, um, if we let absolutely. Now, David, uh, obviously, the old message uh, was stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. Uh, the new message, the new propaganda is stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Um, you noticed something, or at least when we were discussing this earlier, you were highlighting one particular aspect of these two little graphics here. Yes, the colour change. What does red mean? Red means stop. But the new, um, the new uh, slogan is surrounded by little green arrows and ticks. And what does green mean? Well, green means go. Uh, well, it, it absolutely does. And of course, uh, looking at all the commentary out there today, uh, most of the uh, commentary is about the confusion of Boris's message um, and uh, whether we're to go or we're to stop or we're to stay in or we're to go out or we're to start work or we're to stop work. And it's very unclear exactly what the situation is. Um, so let's, uh, let's just come back to Boris uh, for a second. He said, uh, and from this Wednesday, we want to encourage people to take more and even unlimited amounts of outdoor exercise. Uh, he said, uh, you can sit in the sun in your local park. You can drive to other destinations. You can even play sports, but only with members of your own household. So uh, I was just wondering, is this an acknowledgement that, uh, that perhaps they got something wrong by, by not allowing people out, but to a certain degree. But anyway, we're allowed out to sit in the sun now. However, 
you must obey the rules on social distancing and to enforce the, those rules, we will increase the fines for the small minority who can break them. So I'm posing a question to you, David, now uh, you can agree with it or disagree with it as, uh, as you see fit. But is the confusion, bearing in mind what we've just seen from, from Brian, is the confusion over Boris's message intentional? I think it is. Um, and is it designed, in fact, to encourage people to, in inverted commas, break the rules uh, and therefore end up on the receiving end of a fairly draconian police response? Well, we'll come to some draconian police response. Uh, response just shortly. We're seeing this all around the world, including very concerningly from Australia. Um, I don't think that anything they're doing here is accidental. I think that Brian's piece showed that it's it's planned, it's intentional, it's to change people's behaviour. So why would you tell people one thing and essentially the police force another? It does seem designed to cause conflict. And the idea that, well, you can go out into the park, but if you're doing something wrong, not defined, I uh, will fine you all the most, all the most severely, even though it's not really fines we're talking about, we'll come to that in news extra. Um, it seems to be also to leave people with a sense of unease. Maybe that's the concept of trying to get across. If I may just put in a very quick bit here, because I have got quite a lot of qualified um, people speaking to me, psy psychiatrists and psychologists, and, and what they say is if you confuse people, the moment you've done that, their minds become susceptible to the next piece of information. So if somebody's reading something, they come to a point, it confuses them. At that state, at that point, their brain is in a state where the next piece of information can gently flow into their minds. People can research this for themselves. I'd encourage them to do it. But if you have not read that mind space document, you need to do it and look for the paragraph we have pulled out. You'll find the document on the Internet as mind space or one word dot uh, PDF. Right now, uh, David, uh, you've mentioned uh, Robert Peel and, and his views of what British policing should be uh, before. But uh, let's just uh, have a look in a little bit more detail. Yes, I, I was really struck by this. Someone sent me this on, on Twitter and thank you very much for it. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the rules of, sort of nine of them. Um, principles of law enforcement, 1829, how far we've fallen from this. I'll just read one or two. One, the basic mission for which police exist is to prevent crime and disorder as an alternative to the repression of crime and disorder by military force and severity of legal punishment. The ability of the police to perform their duties is dependent upon public approval of police existence, actions, behaviour and the ability of the police to secure and maintain public respect. Police must ensure the willing cooperation of the public and voluntary observance of the law to be able to secure and maintain public respect. We're not talking about voluntary anything anymore. We're talking about deception if you're lucky and coercion if you're not. Um, Peel goes on, um, he said the the police should use physical force to the extent necessary to, to secure observance of the law or res restore order only when the exercise of persuasion, advice and warning is found to be insufficient. He said the police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. The police are only members of the public who are paid to give full time attention to duties which are incumbent upon every citizen uh, in the intent of community welfare. That is wonderful. That is what policing was in this country. But policing now is something else. And I'm suggesting that policing now is what's defined here uh, by the Cambridge Dictionary as the police state. They say a country in which the government uses the police to severely limit people's freedom. Is that not where we are? Uh, I think it is, absolutely. Um, well, look, uh, David, we've got a little bit of video, which I think we'll, we'll uh, leave for, for extra time, if you don't mind. Uh, I, know, I know you would have been keen to have that put out on the, on the main programme, but we've only got 10 minutes left, so, so we need to move on. Um, Brian, uh, well, just before we come back to Brian, let's, uh, let's just mention, if you would like to support the UK Column, if you like the work that we do, uh, then please head over to uh, ukcolumn.org forward slash community. There are options to help us out there, and that would be very much appreciated. But Brian, we had uh, a fantastic AV11 event over the weekend. 
Um, yeah, just um, excellent. And it only occurred because uh, the AV team was so brilliant at uh, working in the background, mainly with yourself, I have to say, because of course it was a live stream. This was a very complicated exercise, but it went very well. The speaker's brilliant. And many people are saying, oh my goodness, now I understand all the things going on. So COVID was, was covered, the behavioral um, abuse by the UK government was there. Um, we were talking about the pharmaceutical industry. Every component was present in talks and it all fitted together. And of course, as you're just going to show, uh, we were delighted to uh, have 30 minutes of Ian Crane, who was able from home to speak to the audience. And that was really the icing on the cake. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we, if you're not aware, uh, you're, if you're an Ian Crane fan, you're not aware, he's uh, at home now. Um, he's recovered covering from the operations, but he still has to deal with his underlying condition. But he was certainly all there in a mental sense. Brilliant. Yes. Now, um, something that I've been uh, trying to, a point I've been trying to make for quite a number of years ago, just my opinion, uh, is over the issue of human rights. Uh, and the reason is this, because this is, these are your human rights at the, uh, at the point of initiation i.e. it's a blank page, you don't have any. Now you compare and contrast that with the idea of unalienable God-given rights uh, because it's quite a, a different thing. So if we look at human rights here, uh, let's give a few, the right to life, the right to freedom of speech, the right to freedom of assembly, the right to protest, and so on. The problem with this is because it begins with a blank page, of course, uh, these rights can disappear again. Uh, at the whim of whomever is in charge. So if we compare that with the idea of unalienable God-given rights, uh, this basically sums up the position, thou shalt not. So in other words, you are unlimited, you have unlimited rights, your rights are presumed, they are untouchable, uh, they are only uh, limited by thou shalt not. Now, how does this work with British common law? Well, in fact, it, the case law is Entick versus Carrington, 1675, which confirms the principle that the individual may do anything but that which is forbidden by law. So the individual has unlimited rights except where the law says they can't do X, Y, or Z. Uh, and we compare that with the, the situation with the state. The state may do nothing that, uh, except that which is permitted by law. Now, what we're seeing increasingly over the last uh, few years is the state is taking on the, the position of the individual and assuming that it has the right to do anything, including limiting your human rights. So this is a situation under the British common law system and all common law countries, humans are, uh, are presumed to have unlimited, uh, or not unlimited, but unalienable God-given rights limited by law. Now, uh, so where does that leave us? Um, this leaves us in the position, well, let's look at this particular uh, document, legislating for the relaxation of the lockdown. Over the last lot of years, we've seen our uh, God-given rights being replaced with the idea of human rights. The presumption then has been taken away that our, our rights are, come from some other source than the government. Uh, and now we have this type of thing. Now, this is by Sir Stephen Laws. Stephen Laws uh, was uh, the, basically the man who wrote the legislation for the government, the government's chief counsel between 2010 and 2016. Uh, and this is what he's saying in this document that he's written for policy exchange. Uh, first of all, a situation of this sort involves a need, this is COVID-19, involves a need for individuals to sacrifice some of their freedoms and liberties, if only because their individual interest in the maintenance and stability of the society to which they belong needs to be given the highest priority. So what he's saying is the needs of the state uh, trump the needs of the individual. Um, and then he goes on to say this, the government should look again at a derogation from the ECHR, that's the Human, European Convention on Human Rights, until the end of the crisis, although that may involve more risk rather than less. Uh, and David, this seems to be uh, one of the top legal minds in the country, uh, basically making my point for me that human rights are dangerous because you start from a blank page, 
uh, there is an assumption that there is no higher power in the universe than a, another human being, which means that uh, society confers that power onto a human being who is supposed to be equal to us all under the law, but in fact put themselves above us by deciding what our rights and what are and what our rights aren't. Uh, and uh, so if we're discussing dangerous situations on this program, uh, we seem to have hit another one here. Absolutely, and we're seeing the uh, the, the reversal of truth constantly. Um, black becomes white, um, a, a system of law to prevent expropriation of, of the goods of the weak by the mighty becomes a means of, of stealing those same goods. Um, and also, th th there is a sense here that a society that does not believe in God-given inalienable rights ultimately will not be able to defend liberty. It will al always ultimately fall for the fear and, uh, and yield to the ever mighty state. And where does it end up? It ends up where B Benito Mussolini uh, pointed as the as the destination. Everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. That's where we're heading. Um, and now just one other point that I want to make on this, because of course a lot of the the sort of uh, commentary on this suggests that that really these ancient rights are are just outdated, and we need to bring things up to date, and that modern human rights are a much better way to do things. You know, in in the in the the graphic that I showed there, thou shalt not, of course. That uh, brings us back to the Ten Commandments. Now, the point here is that law which has lasted longer is better because, in other words, more and more generations of juries have thought that that was good law. Uh, I, so this is contrary to the, the current position that we should throw away all this ancient legislation because it's really of no relevance. But when it comes to the idea of unalienable rights, um, we're not talking about, you know, the 800 years or so of the British Constitution. We're talking about several thousand years of a principle which has gone through society, uh, a, a principle that seems to have never really got to grip, uh, n never really gripped in, on Euro in Europe, but certainly gripped here. And David, it's been around for a very long time and we shouldn't be throwing it away so quickly. It did not. And this is going to be the, uh, the, the subject of a series of articles in the column just very shortly on the common law and what it is and what it means and what it means to have uh, the love of that law in your heart. OK, now let's just quickly move on to this, because uh, last week uh, there was uh, quite an amazing discussion uh, thread appeared on uh, GitHub, which is where uh, Neil Ferguson from Imperial College put the source code for the application that he used to run his computer models. Uh, and this was a spectacular uh, thread on GitHub where uh, quite a number of uh, uh, coders, technology people uh, were making some pretty derogatory comments uh, about the quality of Neil Ferguson's code. Uh, and David, lockdown skeptics here um, covering this. Indeed they are. And, and this is vital because this, this code, remember, is, is the thing that more than any other single piece of, of uh, work propelled the country down the lockdown, propelled, in fact, the whole West down the, the route of uh, confining us all to our homes and um, house arrest. Now, the code um, assessment here is damning in the extreme. Uh, they, they say, first of all, the code, it isn't, Fergus, it isn't the code that Ferguson ran to produce the famous Report 9, um, but a heavily modified derivative of it after having been upgraded for only a month by a team from Microsoft and others. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hold, code. hold on one second. So, so this isn't even the code he was running. This is the the, the better version of the code that others have come the, in to try to clean it up. This is right. Yes, uh, this revised code base is split into multiple files for legibility and is written in C plus plus in modern language, whereas the original program was quote a single fifteen thousand line file that has been worked on for a decade. And he comments, this is considered extremely poor practice. Um, so he's then saying, well, we're trying to get the, the actual original code, but we, we think it will have to go to court to get that. Uh, so they then do go in and look at several other aspects. Among the most concerning is non-deterministic outputs. He says, due to bugs, the code can produce very different results given identical inputs. And they, that's Imperial College, routinely act as if this is unimportant. The problem makes the code unusable for scientific purposes, given that a key part of the scientific method the ability, is the ability to replicate results. 
without replication, the findings might not be real at all, as the field of psychology has been finding out its cost. Even if the original code were released, it's apparent that the same numbers in code nine, in report nine, might not come out of it. Non-deterministic outputs may take some explanation. It's not something previously thought as a possibility. The documentation says the model is stochastic. Multiple runs with different seeds should be undertaken to see average behavior. Stochastic is just a scientific word for random. Now, Peter Hitchens picked up on this, and he, he uh, took the radical step of opening the Oxford English Dictionary to look <laughs> up what stochastic means. And lo and behold, stochastic um, says, well, it's to aim at a mark or guess pertaining to conjecture. So that's the nature of the software that's driving this. Um, and was the, the full report from Lockdown Skeptics goes into a number of examples of Edinburgh University trying to use the software and being unable to get consistent results, variations by 80,000 deaths, for example, and, and uh, Imperial College basically saying, well, it's, it's, it's meant to do that, just, just run it multiple times and take an average. Um, even though there's other cases of Imperial College seeing this as a bug and trying to sort it. In conclusion, they say, all papers based on this code should be retracted immediately. So that would that would take the government's case for lockdown out completely. Imperial modeling efforts should be reset with a new team that isn't under Professor Ferguson um, and which has a commitment to replicatable results with published code from day one. And he goes on, on a personal level, I go further and suggest that all academic epidemiology be defunded. This sort of work is best done by the insurance sector. Insurers employ models and data scientists, but also employ managers whose job it is to decide whether a model is accurate enough for real world usage. And professional software engineers to ensure model software is properly tested, understandable and so on. Academic efforts don't have these people and the results speak for themselves. He describes it as hobbyist level software an unreliable mess. Right, and uh, well, let's move straight on now to uh, a little tweet thread, uh, David. Now, we're going to apologise for the language on the uh, on the screen, but we thought uh, best for people were able to see what's going on here. Just uh, bring us through this. Yes, this was, uh, this was over the weekend. It was very strange. Hackney Police tweeted out that they're fighting a losing battle in the parks today. Literally hundreds of people sitting, having pizza, beers and wine. Oh, the horror. Um, as always, a big thank you to those who are observing the guidelines. And we'll we'll see this re um, repeated in the video we'll show an extra time. Now, there's this account came up, and he was basically suggesting that dogs and horses and battens be used to remove the people from the parks. So I replied that the job of the police is to protect those people, not to attack them. And um, in response to that, there was another swear-ridden uh, quote um, basically say the people out having a picnic are potentially killing people and they deserve everything they get. Um, this, the, 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 this was an extremely strange tweet. I have never seen anything like this on Twitter before in my life. It had only two retweets. It had nine replies, all of which supported my position that the police should be protecting people, but an incredible 451 likes. So 451 people liked the idea of beating the of the police beating up people in parks. And and the, the, the likes kept coming at a kind of regular rate. And I was having a look at some of the accounts that they were coming from. And I've got one example here, 170, following 176 people with 85 followers. There were, there were most of them were like this. The, the were, these accounts are set up, they usually had a football theme because it's easy to get followers if you have a, 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 an affiliation with a football club. They, they build up, they, they, they follow a couple hundred people, they get between 30 and, 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 and 80 followers, so the account looks reasonably legit. And they're all like that. Um, 450 of them liking that nothing of a tweet. It was, it was the strangest thing I'd ever seen on Twitter. Would you, Mike, have any speculation as to what I might have been encountering there? Uh, well, in the chat box, they're already speculating that you were uh, on the receiving end of some 77th Brigade activity. Could it could it be that that's the gallant 77th Brigade doing those stuff? Oh, David, um, David, cut in. They are not paying 
uh, the 77 brigade salaries and the google salaries because google and 77 brigade are integrated they're not paying those salaries for the people to sit there doing nothing and we've already been told they're not just monitoring social media they are actively involved in getting amongst it and changing the way people think and behave and that includes of course coercion if the government is using coercion we can be sure that 77 brigade is using it the british army is now brought into this conspiracy against the british people if you're listening from overseas 2020 we are describing a military uh, supported dictatorship operating not installing itself but operating itself in the uk 77 brigade i think we can put money on it if if that 77th brigade right and and i think it is legitimate to think that it, it's it probably is then 77th brigade are now going on social media and advocating that the police should use violence against peaceful people and if that's the case that is a new law well i'd, I'd just add to that information that we've had which we can't substantiate but it was very interesting information suggested that 77 brigade was already trying tricks to threaten and warn off people um, i think we're going to get further information about dirty tactics like that in the future but we'll see uh, well speaking of the uh, military uh, they seem to be surrounding uh, nicola sturgeon here but uh, i suspect they're not attempting to arrest her or murder her in her bed uh, david what on earth is going on this is uh, VE Day. Um, oh, I see. Uh, celebrations, um, and and uh, Nicholas there. It was. It just struck me that this was profoundly North Korean. Uh, Nicholas there, front and center, uh, framed by the military. Um, she doesn't know quite what to do, so she's looking sad and down because she thinks that's what you do at military events, and um, with the police in the background and. It was just the most North Korean thing I've seen the, the Scottish government stage, and I thought it was just uh, worth commenting on it. Um, now, there is, of course, something more going on on um, military matters in Scotland. Uh, here we have uh, an article from The Times, and they're saying that uh, an army of civilians could fight viruses and hackers. This is from... Uh, 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 I presume they're talking computer viruses as opposed to coronaviruses. No, 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 no. They're talking about viruses, including coronaviruses and hackers and terrorists. So we're going to have an army of civilians. And this, this, this gentleman here, you see, this is Mr. McDonald. He's SMP spokesman uh, for military matters, and he's extremely well qualified for that because he was once a holiday rep on uh, in Ibiza. So he knows a little bit about fighting on the beaches, and uh, he's now um, speaking. Well, we'll see. We'll see exactly what he's speaking because it's very interesting. You might recognise the language, gentlemen. Uh, it says here, Mr. McDonald says that clinging to 20th century idea of national security was no longer tenable. The threat now is less about invasion or hostile states sending bombers over our skies. It's much more nuanced and asserts itself in different ways. He said he hopes to win support from the Scottish government, which is the SNP, right? So that's that's a given. Insists that Holyrood already has the power to establish a national resilience force that could be expanded after the independence or indeed adopted by the UK government on a larger scale. Remember, gentlemen, we are the testing ground when it comes to you next. The idea has been backed by Stuart Crawford, former British Army officer, served as SNP defence spokesman, Paul Sweeney, former Labour MP, and... Um, Major General Mitch Mitchell, Director of the Development Concepts, Concepts and Doctrine Centre at the Ministry of Defence's think tank. He described the concept as, quote, innovative 21st century post-COVID national security thinking. <laughs> there we go. And then Mr. McDonald said that the ideas have been heavily influenced, right, brackets written, heavily influenced, he says, by the Modern Deterrence Project at the Royal United Services Institute. And if we go to that, we find that this is, in fact, um, the modern deterrence project focuses on blending of traditional deterrence and societal resilience against emergent forms of warfare. In the age of hybrid and grey zone warfare, our defence cannot exist solely of armed forces. Governments, businesses, civil society should also work together to strengthen our resilience against existing and emerging threats. Together with the armed forces capabilities, such societal resilience can function as a crucial deterrent. Um, grey zone the gap between peace and war 
the hybrid warfare where everything is part of an attack. Now, where do we know this from? Uh, well, we know it from uh, Mark Cotton Jones, and for anybody that was watching AV11, I couldn't remember his name on on Saturday, so so that's who it was Mark Cotton Jones, uh, who of course uh, was making the point last year that uh, uh, there is no difference between peace of war, peace and war in the twenty first century uh, world. Uh, these are no longer binary states, uh, and just like uh, just like uh, gender. Uh, it's a completely fluid situation. You're on a single timeline. You could either be, you know, maybe a bit more warlike today, a bit less tomorrow. It's a bit like uh, Boris's uh, alert system, really. It sort of go up and down, whatever direction they want to go. It's just totally grey the whole time. Uh, but Brian, um, uh, what's the Queen doing in the present circumstances? Because obviously she's over seventy, and probably... she's not going to be. She's not going to be doing anything ever again, Mike, because uh, the Mail's headline here has got it. Queen may never return to frontline duties. Monarch 94 could remain quarantined in Windsor indefinitely until a vaccine is found. No, We're really not... being told what's coming on here. Yes, absolutely. But of course, that, that headline implies that she's going to be inside the whole time. But Windsur... She's well, not going to be stuck she in the can house. Sit in, sit in the park, and if the police don't see her sitting too close to her family, she's going to be okay. But really, this article is seeding in the public that we're not going to see the monarch again. It says she may appear on a video link or something, but look at how long she's going to be there until who? Bill Gates? Until Mr. Gates' vaccine empire can get his flawed products out. And we know now that he's looking at trillions in profit. You simply multiply the world population by 477 pounds because that's how much he's going to charge. So we're not going to have a monarchy uh, until Mr. Bill Gates can make enough profit. Uh, but I'll, we, but, sorry, I'll leave people to think about it. The constitutional yeah. issues are astonishing. Uh, but we don't need to worry, uh, Brian, because uh, the, uh, well, GP Frontline magazine here has got this front page uh, and David, uh, this is quite an incredible image. Yes, this is uh, again uh, borrowing from the Second World War imagery. Uh, there was a, a, a woman with a wrench um, making aircraft aircraft engines uh, to help fight the Nazis. Well, now we've got the same imagery here, and um, it's it's uh, the NHS is the new army and the new god and the new everything. Yeah, so uh, so the people that are for people that are listening rather than watching, uh, it is a nurse with a mask on, uh, looking extremely aggressive, squishing uh, a coronavirus in her fist uh, and uh, holding her bicep up. Uh, it, it's a picture it's, of strength. Yeah, Second World War, but certainly straight, straight out of the Soviet Union. This is exactly the sort of image that used to be put up. Um, but David, uh, you uh, came across something posted. Well, what is this? Uh, it looks a bit strange. What's going on here? Uh, this well, this is uh, there seems to be some some of the Scots seem to be revolting, and they are doing this by posting a UKcolumn.org sign in the middle of a roundabout near Inverness. So I have no idea who did that. Uh, I thank you very much to the person who spotted it and took a photograph and sent it to us. Uh, this is not the first time we've been alerted to. Uh, uh, signs and uh, bits of information cropping up in unusual places. So if anyone else sees anything like this, uh, please drop us a line and send a photograph. Uh, absolutely. And we'll just end with this, um, uh, a meme that you discovered. Uh, so uh, the, and the lady is saying, so kids, I uh, presume she's a school teacher. So kids, what did we learn during the, during the lockdown? And the answer she's getting is there are only two genders. Vaccines are poison. Bill Gates is a bad man. Social distancing is social conditioning. Yes, and how good that is. There will be lots of lots of children learning lots of truth, um, not in government schools. Uh, all these things may have unforeseen consequences. Uh, absolutely. Indeed. Well, we've extended the news today because we think uh, the news that we're bringing to you is so important. Very, very dangerous times in UK because if the government is allowed to get away with house arrest, of course, that can be repeated in the future. It can be increased in severity. We are watching 
uh, freedoms disappear. It's up to all of us to do something about it. If you can help share UK Column News, we will be extremely grateful. It's quite clear to us that we're being censored now uh, quite heavily in some areas. If you value free speech, help us to keep uh, putting out the facts and uh, the truth. Thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye.